been in our series called Pentecost, and uh, today we're going to wrap that up as we talk about the power of Pentecost. How many believe that God holds all power in his hand? Amen? But the reason he gives us the Holy Spirit is so that that power can flow through us, can live in us, and we can be a conduit of it. Our text is Acts chapter 17 this morning, Acts chapter 17, verses 1 through 6. I'm going to read it together. It'll be on the screen, but if you have your Bibles, just follow along with me. Starting in verse 1, it says, Paul and Silas then traveled and came to Thessalonica. I skipped down just a little bit there, where there was a Jewish synagogue. As was Paul's custom, he went to the synagogue service, and for three Sabbaths in a row, he used the scriptures to reason with the people. He explained the prophecies, and he proved that the Messiah must suffer and rise from the dead. He said, this Jesus I'm telling you about is the Messiah. And some of the Jews who listened were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, along with many God-fearing Greek men and quite a few prominent women. But some of the Jews were jealous, and they attacked the home of Jason searching for Paul and Silas. And let me just add, that's little Jason's namesake, Jason from the Bible. And uh, they attacked Jason searching for Paul and Silas. Not finding them there, they dragged out Jason and some of the other believers instead and took them before the city council. Paul and Silas, and this is our key verse this morning, have turned the world up side down they've caused trouble all over the world they shouted and now they are here disturbing our city too paul and silas full of the holy ghost began to turn the world upside down and those who partnered with them those who came in alignment with them like jason in the house of jason are also attacked because the enemy isn't happy when we're doing the work of the Lord. The enemy isn't happy when we're full of the power of the Holy Ghost, but not just full when we are conduits of it, allowing it to flow through us to impact the world around us. We are given the baptism of the Holy Spirit so that we can impact this world for the glory of God. Can I get a witness in this room this morning? We need the Holy Spirit. Can somebody say amen? We need the power to turn the world upside down again. Hello? I don't know about you, but I'm not satisfied with the way it is right now. Listen, God has moved throughout history so many times. I've been a part of many moves of God's spirit from my youth to current day. I've seen God move. I've seen miracles performed. He has done them in me and through me. He has done them in you and through you at times. God has moved in this house. He has moved in other places. Many of us have been a part of or, or were able to be a part of on some level the great move of God a few years back. Uh, at, at Brownsville, the Brownsville Revival, and other outpourings of God's Spirit around the world. My own heritage, my own family is from Wells. One of the greatest moves of God was the Welch Revival back in early 1900s, 1902, and uh, with, with Evan Roberts. I, I am a student in some degree of the moves of God throughout history, but I'm not satisfied with the past. I want a move of God's power and spirit in the church today, and not just to make us feel good, but so that you and I will have the power to turn the world upside down for Jesus until he comes again. Can somebody say amen? amen? There's a need to turn the world upside down because the world is full of sin. The world is full of immorality. The world is full of racism. Addiction is on an all new high. I just heard on the news yesterday that now marijuana is more popular and used by more people than alcohol. If that doesn't blow your mind, I don't know what will. That was a new statistic that marijuana, even though it is still illegal in a lot of places, is used more frequently by more people than alcohol, which is legal. That's mind boggling to me. Rioting, when somebody doesn't like what somebody else does, when groups of people don't like decisions that are made. Rioting is on the increase. Evil of all kind. 
Now, the Bible, we shouldn't be shocked because the Bible tells us this is going to happen in the last days. But it also tells us that when things begin to happen like this, that God is going to move by his spirit. It also tells us in the last days, the last hours of time, that the church is going to arise full of the power of the Holy Spirit and that signs and wonders will follow those who believe. If you believe this morning, would you say amen? Amen. Now, hundreds of years earlier, prior to the text that I just read, the prophet Joel prophesied and spoke a message about that which would happen in the book of Acts. You're familiar with this verse in Joel chapter 2. Starting at verse 28, it says this. God speaks through the prophet Joel, and he says, I will pour out my spirit upon all people. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. In those days, I will pour out my spirit even on servants, men and women alike, and I will cause wonders in the heavens and on earth, blood and fire and columns of smoke. Verse 31, the sun will become dark, the moon will turn to blood, read before that great and terrible day of the Lord. But everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Hallelujah. Friends, there is a need for the people of this nation and the people around the world, the unchurched, the backslidden, the down and out, to call on the name of the Lord and be saved. Can I get a witness? I'm telling you, there's a need for your unsaved children to call on the name of the Lord. There's a need for your boss that doesn't know Jesus to call on the name of the Lord. Your coworkers, your friends, your neighbors, the people in the marketplace, uh, the people you've not met yet, but you'll meet them today as you leave here at the restaurant or wherever you go. The world needs to know Jesus and call on the name of Jesus. And Romans tells us, how can that happen without a preacher? How can that happen without someone like you to tell them? And how can can you tell them without the Spirit of God dwelling in you? If you read the book of Acts, you will see that the Holy Spirit was poured out on all of those who believed in the upper room as they gathered. You'll understand what happened there. But it doesn't say they were baptized in the Holy Spirit so that they could speak in tongues. It doesn't say that. It says they were baptized in the Holy Spirit and they did speak in tongues as an initial physical evidence. But they were baptized in the Holy Spirit so that they could be my witnesses, Jesus says, to Jerusalem, Judea, and to the uttermost parts of the earth so that they could tell others about Jesus, so that others could call on the name of Jesus and be saved. We need the power of the Holy Ghost. Can somebody say amen? Now, that was in Joel. But when you fast forward to Acts a few hundred years later, we see in Acts chapter 2 where Jesus says, or the, Luke writes, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. Now, we just celebrated Easter just last month. 50 days, in fact, from last Sunday. <clears throat> this is, of course, I'm talking to the church. This is, of course, Easter is the resurrection. Pentecost is powerful, and it is part of what Jesus did when he raised from the dead. It is a second work of God's grace. Now, hear me this morning. I'm not talking about salvation here. I'm talking about a second experience of how many love God's grace in your life? Like you love the fact that Jesus saved you. How many say, I needed Jesus to save me? (laughs) I was lost, I was undone, I was desperate, I, was, I didn't know what was going on, Jesus set me free. And that's the most important, that's all it takes to get to heaven. But he didn't stop there. Because Jesus never stops with just enough. He is more than enough. Can I get a witness in this room? Jesus is more than enough. He doesn't just want you to get into heaven by the skin of your teeth, but he wants to bless you with the power to overcome the problems and the temptations of this world. He wants to fill you with the power to not just know him, but that others might also know him because of your testimony. He wants to empower you with the Holy Ghost so that you can be his sons, his daughters, and his witness to the uttermost parts of the world. Pentecost, which means 50, 50 days after Passover, was, is the Jewish celebration of the Feast of Weeks. And so when it happens, it's considered the 
first fruits or the first fruits offering would take place on the feast of weeks. That is the commitment of the first 10% of everything that had been harvested or would be harvested. It's the first fruits giving that takes place. And that's powerful and that's beautiful. We believe in tithing. We believe in first fruits. We believe in celebrating the resurrection and we believe in celebrating the baptism of the, or the, the spirit. But for Pentecostals and for those that were part of the first Pentecostal service in the upper room, Pentecost took on a whole new meaning. It takes on a whole, it's not just the celebration any longer, which the celebration is powerful. The, the festival is beautiful and it should be acknowledged, but that takes on a whole new level whenever you recognize what happened on this particular feast of weeks. On this Pentecost, in the upper room, 120 had gathered. They had gathered because Jesus told them to go there and wait until the Spirit came. Don't just go and pray and then go about your business, but go and tarry, go and wait, go and hang out there and continue to seek me until something happens. Jesus told his disciples that they ought to participate, particularly on this Pentecost. And this is what he says in Acts chapter 1-8. He says, you will receive power. Everybody say power. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. I'm going to read that again. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. I don't know about you, but I need power. Come on. I love Jesus, and I know Jesus dwells in me, and I know I am saved, and I am sealed by the power of the Spirit in me. I know all of that. I get that. But I need power just to get up and get going every morning. Come on. I need some extra grace to face those around me that don't know him. Hello? I need some extra provision and anointing on my life in order to deal with the stresses and the trials and the tribulations that come my way. I need some extra anointing of God's spirit upon me. And I'm just here to tell you today, believers, hear me. There is a second work of the grace and glory of God that is available to all who believe him, and it's called the baptism of the Holy Ghost. It happened in the upper room on the day of Pentecost, and subsequently it happened time and time and time again throughout the book of Acts and the New Testament and throughout history up until this very day. The Holy Ghost is available to you today for the power to be his witness and to withstand the enemy in your life. Receive the Holy Ghost today. Receive it today. If you've never been baptized in the Holy Ghost, today's your day. God's no respecter of persons. He's not going to give it to one and not another. Anyone who desires it, just like salvation. If you call on the name of the Lord, you shall be saved. If you'll ask, just like these 120, in wait and tarry and hang out and not grow weary in it. The Bible says keep knocking, keep asking, keep seeking. You will find. Trust him and be filled with the Holy Ghost. Then on Pentecost morning, Luke tells us in Acts chapter 2, verse 4. It was verse, chapter 1, verse 8 where they say receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. But listen, it happens in two, chapter, or chapter 2, verse 4. Everyone present, somebody say everyone. It wasn't just some. God doesn't do it for some and not others. If you want it, he'll do it. Everyone present was filled with the Holy Spirit and began speaking in other languages as the Holy Spirit gave them this ability. It is an ability that comes from the Holy Spirit, but it is for everyone who desires it and who will seek it. And God will grant it. He will give it to you. The effects and the response of that outpouring are astonishing. You read it. You study it out for yourself. I'm telling you, the, the, the effects are eternal. The effects are present this very day in this very church. Everyone present was filled they were amazed and perplexed, those who were gathered and heard what was going on in the upper room. That's what scripture says. You read it. They were amazed and perplexed because what they, they had gathered for, for Pentecost, they had gathered for, the, for the, uh, the, the Feast of Weeks from all over 
from all over the place, many languages represented. Many did not speak the local language, and they heard coming from the upper room, they heard people speaking in their own language. Hallelujah. They heard what they could not understand before, and now they understand it. But it is a witness. It is a testimony. What they hear is not just like, hey, guys, let's go out and have pizza. That's not what they're hearing in their own language. <laughs> They're hearing the praise of the Most High God. They're hearing honor of God Almighty. They're hearing a declaration that what God has done of who Jesus is, the Son of the living God, the Messiah, the one who had come and given his life and raised from the dead and would come again. They are given a testimony of the resurrection of Christ, and everyone is hearing it in their own language. And the Bible says that on that day, more than 3,000 people were converted to Christianity in that one moment. And it only explodes in growth from there. It is the birth of the church. You can read it in, Luke, in Acts chapter 2. And I don't have time to unfold it all for you right there, but I encourage you to write that down, to go home and read that account today. Because it says there in verses 40 through 44 that 3,000 in all were added to the church. And it says they also devoted themselves to the Lord, to the apostles' teaching, and to fellowship, to sharing in meals together, and to the Lord's Supper. And there was this sense of awe that came over them. We need a sense of awe to come over us. Come on. And then it says this, and it says, And the apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders and all the believers met together in one place and shared everything they had Pentecost not only changed the church but it impacted and changed the world Pentecost don't let anyone put you down for attending a Pentecostal church don't let anyone put you down because you believe in the power of Pentecost. Don't let anyone, even those that may be well-meaning, try to distract you or distract you from the fact that you are impacted and empowered with the Holy Ghost on your life. But you may say, well, you know, it just kind of hurts my feelings, Pastor, that people tell me I'm a holy roller or, or I'm emotional or I don't like to go to that church because they're this way or they're that way. Don't, listen, you can love them in spite of however they feel about you. Don't let them distract you or detract you from the power of Pentecost. It is real. I can testify today that it changed my life. Oh, I loved him and I served him. But when I got baptized in the Holy Ghost, there was a new level of the glory and the power of God that filled my life. And it not only filled me, but it healed me and it set me free and it helps me and it encourages me and it changes me and it empowers me to impact the world around me. We need the Holy Ghost. We need the Holy Ghost. The church of the living God needs a fresh impartation of the Holy Spirit today. The Pentecostal church needs a fresh impartation of Pentecost. We need it. I'm hungry for it. Listen, unless you think this morning that I'm talking about it, some kind of emotional high, I'm not. I love emotional celebrations. I love to preach the way I'm preaching this morning. <laughs> I love to get excited and jump up and down. I love to sing songs that, that, it, that exemplify Jesus and, and praise him and lift him up. But I'm not just talking about some kind of emotional lift this morning. I'm talking about a power to change me and change the world. I'm talking about an anointing that breaks chains. I'm talking about something that empowers me to see and understand things that I cannot see and understand in the natural. I'm talking about an ability to hear from God in a way and to talk to God in a way that even Greg doesn't understand or know. But God understands because the Spirit prays through me. I'm talking about the anointing of the Spirit of God. It changed the world. Now, these guys didn't know what to expect. These 120, they hadn't known what to expect from the time Jesus called them. <laughs> every moment, every day was a surprise. Now Jesus has been crucified. He's come back. He's ascended. And the last instruction was to go to this particular upper room and wait, to pray, 
and wait. And now, maybe the biggest surprise of all, the Holy Ghost, and the Bible says, read it for yourself, the Bible says, cloven tongues like as a fire came and descended upon each of them. And they began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them the utterance. They didn't understand what they were saying, but the 3,000 or more that had gathered around, they heard everything in their own language, and they were converted to the Lord on that day. You may not understand Pentecost, but neither did the disciples. You may not get it all in its entirety, but I just need you to know, just like the disciples, you need to want it. (laughs) You need to hunger for it. You need to desire it. You need to ask God to fill me with it. Lord, if it's real. I remember the story of Dr. Mark Rutland, who was a Methodist pastor before he was a Pentecostal pastor and uh, then became the president of Southeastern University and Oral Roberts University and, and has a great missions endeavor today. But his testimony was he was Methodist. He was not Pentecostal. He loved Jesus but he was depressed and suicidal. He loved Jesus, but he was ready to leave the ministry. He loved Jesus, but he had already tried to take his own life. Dr. Mark Rutland loved Jesus, but he hadn't experienced the power of Pentecost. And in a particular gathering, conference of some kind, sitting on the back row, hearing someone talk about Pentecost, he said to God, not in some great cry of anguish, but in a silent voice of desperation. God, if this Holy Ghost thing is real, and I'm paraphrasing here, but if he said, if this thing is real, if what you tell us is is still for today, then I want it. I need it in my life because I don't know what else to do. And he tells the story out of an altar call in that moment, standing up, unsure of what the Holy Ghost was or if it was even available for today, unsure of the details of what might happen. He stood up on a back row and began to walk forward to an altar where he said, fill me. But before he could get up the aisle, the Holy Ghost fell upon him. He fell to his face, speaking in other tongues as the Spirit gave him the utterance. And he was baptized in the Holy Ghost. His, the depression left. The suicidal thoughts left. The anguish left. The call of ministry returned, and he impacted the world around him for the glory of God. I'm telling you, some of you just need an impartation of the Holy Ghost in your life. Maybe you need it for your marriage. Maybe you need it for your family. Maybe you need it for your finances. Maybe you need it just for your ministry. But we all need the Holy Spirit. If we're going to turn this world upside down, and this world needs to be turned upside down, then we need the Holy Ghost. Because the Pentecostal power is a changing power. It changes things. Now, I was raised in it. it I was. Y'all wouldn't even, y'all would feel, y'all would feel wild and crazy it, 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 if you went to the kind of church I went to when I was growing up. I'm proud of it. I'm thankful for it. I'm not, I'm not, uh, I'm not uh, apologizing for it. I'm just telling you, some of y'all would be like, what? You think you're in a Pentecostal church now? I went to a Pentecostal church. Anybody else go to one of those? Now, I, I, I'll be the first to admit, there was some emotionalism that took place in the church I went to, but it wasn't wrong. Because when the Holy Ghost comes upon you, I want you to know some emotions take place. <laughs> Come on. I'm telling you, emotions are stirred up when the Holy Ghost moves into a room. You're going to cry, you're going to laugh, you're going to jump, you're going to shout. Church I grew up into, there was lots of people that started running. I know people laugh at that today, and people go, oh, well, you know, we need a more dignified expression of the Holy Ghost today. But I think it's the dignified expression of the Holy Ghost today that has watered down the church, the Pentecostal church. It's the watered-down uh, expression of the Holy Ghost today that has kept us from being witnesses in the, to the world around us. It is the, it is the watered-down expression of not wanting to be too emotional that has made us take a back seat to, to other denominations and other churches. And I'm telling you, it's just time. I don't want more emotion. I, as I said already, I'm not looking for an emotional lift, but I'm looking for the changing, life-changing power of the Holy Ghost to, to arrest us in our spirit and to stir us up in our hearts and to make us world changers on the outside of these four walls. Pentecostal power 
is a changing power. And let me just tell you, if it makes somebody run up and down an aisle, jump up and down, scream and shout, then so be it. I don't care what they do inside of these four walls as long as they walk out of here and testify that Jesus is the son of the living God. And he's coming back after a church without spot or wrinkle. It's time for the Pentecostal church to be Pentecostal again. Woo! It's not just about speaking in tongues. There's a lot of people that speak in tongues that I question their Pentecostalism. Now it's quiet. I'm not questioning whether they got baptized in the Holy Ghost. That was the evidence of speaking in other tongues. But I question the fullness of the Spirit in them because if you can speak in other tongues but still gossip, there's a problem. If you can speak in other tongues but murmur and complain about your job, about your church, about your marriage, hello? About your children, about all the issues of life, then I question the baptism of the Holy Spirit in your life. I question the fullness of that Spirit. Now we all leak. Come on now. Greg Evans leaks. But the minute I see myself murmuring and complaining, y'all know me, I always ask for a little bit of affirmation here because I just like to make sure I'm not the only one, you know? We're all human. But does anybody, I'm talking to you Pentecostal Christians, those of you that are filled with the Holy Ghost, any of you start murmuring and complaining sometimes, I'm raising my hand. Just anybody else with me? Any of you? I don't want to ask you to raise your hand if you ever gossip before. <laughs> the minute Greg Evans finds himself, or, or sometimes it has to be pointed out to Greg Evans because I'm not perfect, far, far from it. But the minute it comes to my realization, my understanding that there's some flesh going on here, Pastor Rich and Greg, because I do have the Holy Ghost inside of me, there's a conviction that rises up. There's something that just arrests me in my spirit. Now, I, I don't, in that moment, I don't run to my wife or, or my team or any of you and go, oh, I'm just, I'm so horrible. I was gossiping. I was saying this. I was complaining about that. But I'll tell you what I do run to. I run to Jesus. I find myself some kind of private place to just seek his face and just bow my heart and repent of anything I've done that I know was ungodly or not, and not in accordance with his word. And I ask God to refill me with a fresh measure of the Holy Ghost because there's not room in my heart for the Holy Ghost to dwell and gossip to dwell. There's not room in my heart for the Holy Ghost to dwell and the things of the flesh to dwell. There's only room for God. There's only room for the Holy Spirit. And the minute I recognize and realize that the flesh is rising up, I've got to bring that flesh under submission by the power of God in me and call it as though it were not. It cannot have control in my life. It cannot rule and reign over my heart and I will not submit to it, but I will submit to you, almighty God, all day, every day. Fill me fresh with the Holy Spirit. It's a life-changing power. It's not about speaking in tongues, but you will speak in tongues. And it is a prayer language that God gives you because when you pray in the spirit, the Bible says you pray with wisdom and understanding, not your wisdom, not your understanding, but God's wisdom and God's understanding. It's a changing power. Everybody say changing power. It'll change your personality. Uh Oh, it will. When a person's saved, Filled with the Holy Spirit, you will experience a change of attitude. You will experience a change of actions. Come on. You will even experience a change of ambition. What I once longed to do, I no longer long to do. I want to do something different for the glory of God. So he'll change your attitude, your actions, your ambition. Your personality is going to change. 
And if you see the old man, the flesh man, that personality creeping back in, you need to say, God, fill me fresh with your Holy Spirit. Some of you have been baptized in the Holy Ghost, but you need a fresh impartation of his spirit this morning. Come on now. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 17 says, This means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. <laughs> the old life is gone, and a new life has begun. Ezekiel 36, 26 says, And I will give you a new heart, and I will put a new spirit in you, and I will take out your stony, stubborn heart, and give you a tender and responsive heart. Oh, God. Give me a tender and responsive heart. I want to hear the Spirit of God in me, when, especially when I'm not doing it right, especially when I'm missing the mark. But I want that tender heart when somebody comes along with a need in their life. I want that tender and compassionate heart when someone comes along that I just need to humble myself to where they are and say, let me serve you, let me help you, anoint me, God, and use me to impact this life. Not only will your personality change, but your purpose will change. It'll change from selfishness to service. Hello? Human nature is selfish. Little Jace and Judith and Cameron, they're little babies. All they need to do when they're hungry is cry. And let me tell you, I'm not around those other two, but let me tell you, Jace knows how to cry. And the minute he's hungry, maybe this is with all babies. I don't know. I don't quite remember it quite this way with mine, except for maybe Candace. So she might be just getting a little bit of, you know, her own medicine there. I'm just saying. But the minute Jace is hungry, you no, know, the second Jace is hungry, it can go from this to what? He depends on someone else to feed him. He's selfish in the sense that he can't do it for himself. He's selfish in the sense that even as he grows and becomes a toddler and can do some stuff, he doesn't know until he reaches a certain place in his life that he can do some stuff for himself. And he shouldn't just take his ability to do things for himself only, but for others as well. We're that way as humans, as adults, but not those who are full of the Spirit. God changes us from selfishness to service. It's not about what have you done for me. It's what can I do for the glory of God? What can I do to serve you? I joke sometimes that there must be an invisible sign on my forehead that says, ask me for money. <laughs> because everywhere I go to get gas or I'm walking through Walmart parking lot, I'm telling you, it's, and it's been this way from forever ago people walk up excuse me excuse me you can I, I don't have any money i need some help now i'm not saying i give money to everybody in fact i don't give money to very many people but i'll tell you what i do give them i pray over them you know if i have some money if i have a few dollars which i just normally don't if i have something and i feel like it's a good a good thing to do and there's a real need i'll, I'll bless other people that's not what i'm talking about today but i'll tell you what i do i, I always just like just like just like the the disciples with the, with the uh, cripple man at the gate. They said, we don't have any money, but what I have, I'll give you. Silver and gold, I don't have, but I'll give you what I've got. In the name of Jesus, be healed. So every time somebody asks me for help, I'm telling you, it's not just an invisible sign. It is the power of the Holy Ghost. I don't look at any, ex any connection with somebody, whether it's a waitress that I chose to go to to sit at a table and ask them to serve me, or whether it's somebody in a parking lot somewhere, or whether it's somebody that walks through the doors of these church or sits in these pews. I don't consider any connection with someone an accident or just kind of a happenstance. I'm telling you, I believe in divine appointments and as spirit-filled sons and daughters of God, God will give you divine appointments. And when someone walks up and has a need, whether it's just a hello or please bless me or help me if you can, I'm telling you something comes on me and I'll say, I don't have maybe what you're asking for, but I'll tell you what I have. I have a relationship with Jesus. I know that he can change your life and he can help you. I don't know what else to do for you, but right now, can we just pray together? And most of the time they'll receive that prayer. But many times it's impactful in their life. I'm not perfect at that. I don't do it 100% of the time, but I do it 99% of the time because it changed. The Holy Ghost changed my personality, and it changed my purpose, and it changed my practice. 
I don't do things the way the world does them. I don't do them the way that Greg would do them in the natural. Saul changed from persecutor to preacher. They, God changed his name. The Holy Spirit empowered him and changed his practices. The Bible says in Acts chapter 9, verse 20, it says, straightway he preached Christ in the synagogues that he is the Son of God. He had just been killing Christians. <laughs> and straightway, when Jesus set him free, when the Holy Ghost empowered him, and straightway, everybody say straightway, he preached the gospel of Jesus Christ. The things you used to do, you won't want to do any longer. We need the Holy Ghost. <laughs> If some of you Christians in here, some of you people that are saved and God set you free, but you've seen some sin creep back into your life, you've seen some issues come back in, you've seen some desires come back in, I just need you to know you just can be set free today by the power of the Holy Spirit. Let him come in and change everything about you. Secondly, this morning, Pentecostal power is a compassionate power. And let me tell you, compassion is more than just love. There's a lot of people who say, oh, I just love everybody. And I do. I love people. I love them. But it's not about the love. It's about the action. It's about what am I going to do? How am I going to serve the body of Christ? How am I going to serve the, the, the community around me? How am I going to serve those people I work alongside? How am I going to serve my family? How am I going to serve my spouse? How am I going to serve others by the power of God that is in my life? Spirit of God, the power of Pentecost is a compassionate power. This compassion grows, and it groans. It grows. Paul says in Acts chapter 20, uh, Luke writes that Paul shed tears for three years concerning the church and the false teachers and the vicious wolves that were in them. Let me tell you something. If you, if you aren't growing in compassion for the lost, then you need a fresh impartation of the Holy Ghost. And if you're not groaning in compassion for the lost, then you need a fresh impartation of the Holy Spirit. What do you mean by groaning, Pastor? Well, Romans chapter 8, verse 26 says this. It says that the Holy Spirit helps us in our weakness. For example, we don't know what God wants us to pray, but the Holy Spirit prays for us with groanings that cannot be expressed in words. That's why we need this prayer language. Because I can pray in the spirit things that I don't know how to pray in English. When people share, oftentimes as a pastor, people come and share. I'm going to ask you all, thank you, just, just don't start playing just yet. Give me, give me three minutes and then start playing. Somebody will come to me often and say, Pastor, I'm going through this, I'm going through that. And, and I'll, I'll try to encourage them. The Holy Spirit will speak through me. I'll, I'll, I'll speak some encouraging word through them but I don't know really what they need, but God does. I'll pray with them, I'll pray for them, but I don't just leave it there. I walk away from there and I find my prayer calls and I find my place of seeking God and I go, let me just tell you, and if you've ever questioned, this is just an encouragement to you, I go into a secret place and I groan in the spirit for you. Because here's the thing, sometimes Greg doesn't know what Greg needs. But the Holy Spirit knows what Greg's, Greg needs. And so I'll go for, just speaking of myself, I'll go into a prayer and I'll just pray and I'll use the prayer language that God gave me when he baptized me in the Holy Spirit to pray things that I don't know how to pray in, the, in my English language. But when I pray in the Spirit, God understands because the Spirit prays things through me that I don't understand or know. It's groanings in the Spirit. You need a prayer language. You need it for yourself, but you need it to bless others. You need it to pray with others and to pray for others. So this compassion doesn't just grow or groan. It gives and it goes. It gives of our time, our talent, and our treasure, but it also goes. It goes wherever God calls you. And God will call you. When you're full of the Spirit, God will call you. He may call you across the street. I'm serious. You may see a stranger walking down the street and God will just say, you need to go talk to that person. He'll set you up with divine appointments. When you're full of the Holy Ghost, I'm telling you, you shouldn't be surprised by anything. God will use you to talk to, to people that would reject everybody else and have rejected everybody else, and maybe even those that have rejected you in the past. But there's a compassion. I don't have time to turn there right now, but in Mark 16, he tells us, go into all the world and preach the good news. 
to everyone. There's a need for this compassion because the world is lost and undone. I thank God for those two precious missionaries in Haiti that were killed yesterday, two days ago, because they were serving God in a hostile environment. But it was the Holy Spirit in them that said, I'm not going to leave because there's war. I'm not going to leave because there's, there's anarchy. I'm not going to leave. I'm going to do what God's called me to do. I'm going to come right. I'm protecting these children. And I'll tell you, I, I don't know the whole backstory there, but I, I've heard enough. I've read enough about it to understand this. I'll promise you, those children that were under their care will never forget, not just because they'll never forget the love and the compassion of Jesus Christ that flowed through those two precious missionaries. They are heroes of the faith. They went when God said go. It wasn't because they were just dare, daredevils, spiritual daredevils. It wasn't because they were better than anyone else. It was because they were full of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Ghost had come upon them and compelled them to say yes to the will of God. And God's looking for some people today that he can fill with the Spirit, a fresh measure of his Spirit, so that you can go into the highways and the byways and compel others to come in. This Pentecostal power is a converting power, and it's a continuing power. Stand together with me all around this room right now. The Holy Spirit is speaking to some of you this morning because you need to get saved. That's his first work, is to convict us of sin. Before he gives us a new language, he wants to give us a new heart. There's people in this room this morning, there's people watching online today. And you say, I want to give my life to Jesus. I, I want the spirit that you're preaching about. I, I want the power to change my life. I need some things changed. I want to give my life to Christ. First and foremost, the spirit of God is a saving power. Acts 4, 2, 12 says, there is a salvation in no one else. God has given no other name under heaven by which men must be saved.